before we get to the location today, let's just discuss some of the origins of the story. 1981, Allenwood Correctional Facility. Burton Kaplan, a Jewish gangster who would have been in his late 40s at the time, is doing a stretch in prison for the manufacturing and distribution of quaaludes, a depressive drug which would become popular for recreational use. Burton Kaplan was an associate of the Lucchese mobster Christopher Christy Tick Fernari, who operated out of the 19th hole on 86th Street in Diker Heights, Brooklyn. While incarcerated, Kaplan meets Frank Santora Jr., another mafia associate. They immediately form a bond when Frank Santora mentions that his uncle was Gambino mobster Jimmy the Clam Eppolito, whom Burton Kaplan was at one time friendly with. Kaplan, a one-time naval radio operator who was stationed in Japan during the 1950s, had returned back from his time in the service and went to work for his family's appliance shop. It would be through that work that he met Jimmy the Clam Eppolito, when he installed air conditioner units in his Grand Mark Social Club. Burt Kaplan would become a fixture at the Grand Mark Social Club and soon turn into a degenerate gambler. It would be through an accumulation of bad gambling debts that he would meet Christopher Christie Tick Fernari, who would serve as his loan shark. Kaplan would go on to get involved in the selling of knockoff designer products, marijuana, methamphetamine, and anything else he can get his hands on that was worth flipping for a profit. Unfortunately for Jimmy the Clam Eppolito, him and his son Jimmy Eppolito Jr. had been killed in 1979, a couple of years before Kaplan would meet Centora at Allenwood Correctional Facility. They were shot dead on the service road of the Belt Parkway by Nino Gaggi and Roy DeMeo. If you would like to see where this incident took place, check out my upload, The House on Cropsey Avenue. Centura would go on to tell Burt Kaplan that his cousin Louis Eppolito, nephew of Jimmy the Clam, was an NYPD detective. Not only that, but him, along with his partner Stephen Caracappa, had access to privileged information and were willing to do some dirty work if the price was right. And with that, the seeds of a long and bloody relationship were planted. According to Lucchese underboss Anthony Gaspipe Casso, who took the reins at the 19th hole after Christy Chick Fenari went to prison in 1986, the first job that the Mafia cops Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracappa would do for Casso would be delivering Jimmy Heidel to him and Vic Amuso in the parking lot of the Toys R Us on Flatbush Avenue in October of 1986. This would go down as the first and only time Castle would be in the presence of the Mafia cops. Castle talks about this in his 302s when he started cooperating with the government. However, according to Burton Kaplan, who became a witness as well, the Mafia cops' first job for Casso actually happened in 1985. Kaplan would state that Anthony Casso had approached him and asked if he would be able to find a person who could cash two 500,000 treasury bills. Kaplan reaches out to Joe Banda, a banker friend of his, who contacts jeweler Israel Greenwald. Greenwald successfully cashes a treasury bill in Europe, but soon finds the authorities are on his tail. With the fear of Greenwald cooperating, Kaplan arranges for the Mafia cops Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracappa to pull over and abduct Israel Greenwald in early 1986. After they abduct Israel Greenwald, he is delivered to Frank Centora Jr., who would kill and bury Greenwald. According to Kaplan, the mob cops were paid $30,000 for this job. But let's go back to the incident that Castle claims was the first job that he asked Kaplan to coordinate, because that's the location where we will visit today. In 1986, Gambino mobster Mickey Boy Paradiso would assemble a hit team tasked to take out Lucchese underboss Anthony Gaspipe Casso. Mickey Boy put the team together at the behest of Gambino boss John Gotti's right-hand man and longtime confidant, Angelo Quack Quack Ruggiero. Why this happened seems to be up for debate, but according to Sammy the Bull Gravano, it would be years earlier when Angelo Ruggiero had developed a hatred of Casso after Castle reportedly spread news to the Gambino leadership that Angelo Ruggiero was a rat. Angelo never forgot that, and when his best friend Gotti became boss, he finally got the nod to take out Casso. Jimmy Heidel, Bob Baring, Nicky Guido, and a driver named Dom Latore would be the team that would hunt down Casso. 
On September 14, 1986, Anthony Gaspipe Casa was shot on East 70th Street and Veterans Avenue in Brooklyn. He would manage to escape with his life. He would then make contact with Kaplan in order for him to find out any information as to who did the shooting. Well, it just so happened that this info would be easier to get than they would imagine. The hit on Casa would take place in the confines of the 63rd Precinct, the same precinct where corrupt mafia detective Louis Eppolito was working. Stephen Caracappa, his partner in crime, worked as a detective on a task force at that time. Kaplan reaches out to Eppolito in order to get the info on the suspected shooters of the case. According to Casso, Kaplan does just that. He would meet Casso and hand him crime scene photos and a list of the potential shooters involved. However, there is an alternate story, which possibly explains how Casso found out. According to retired police detective Tommy Dades, he was able to confirm through an informant that Casso originally found out because Jimmy Heidel was overheard talking about the incident in the proximity of his sister's boyfriend, Frankie Saperano, whose father and uncle were Colombo family mobsters. Frankie Saperano would give up Jimmy Heidel's intel to the Colombos, who immediately notified Casso. Like many stories in this realm of mob history, there's always alternate versions of events, and we can only try to form our opinions on what makes the most sense. Nonetheless, it was time for the Mafia cops to go out and get a hold of Jimmy Heidel. In October of 86, they would grab Heidel by Diker Park in Brooklyn, New York, where he was supposedly getting ready for a sit-down. They would arrest him and bring him to a garage on Nostrand Avenue. At the garage, they would hogtie Heidel and throw him in the trunk. They would then send a page out to Burton Kaplan who reached out to Casso about the meeting place. They would meet at the back parking lot of the Toys R Us on Flatbush Avenue. The cops would hand Jimmy Heidel, hogtied, over to Gaspipe Casso and Vuka Musso, who would bring him to a basement of a home on East 73rd Street. That's where Casso would supposedly torture and interrogate Heidel. And as he mentions in his 60 Minutes interview with Ed Bradley, he would shoot Heidel at least 15 times while interrogating him. Heidel's body would never be found. Interestingly, Casso would later claim that while the Mafia cops were sitting on Jimmy Heidel, Colombo mobster Chicky DiMartino would tell him in prison that he was also sitting on Heidel with a hit team ready to pounce and take out Heidel. DiMartino would tell Casso that he actually witnessed the Mafia cops take Heidel into custody. Burton Kaplan would also go on to claim that Anthony Casso in fact knew Jimmy Heidel and was surprised to learn that he was a part of the hit team. Anthony Castro stated that he had just got him a job recently working for the union. He also stated that years prior, Jimmy Heidel and his buddies were messing around with some local Chinese restaurant. The Chinese restaurant owner appealed to Casso for help. Casso talks about running into Jimmy Heidel and his friends, and Jimmy Heidel having a dog in his possession that kept charging towards Casso. Casso repeatedly told Jimmy Heidel to stop the dog from charging at him. When that didn't stop, Casso pulled out a gun with a silencer and killed the dog on the spot. Told Jimmy Heidel to put the dog in the trunk. A couple of very interesting additives to a wild tale. The history of Casso and the mob cops would continue on and the trail of blood would grow over the next few years. However, our story ends at that today. Now let's head over to the Toys R Us on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, New York City, where Anthony Gaspipe Casso and Vic Amuso would meet the Mafia cops, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracappa, and receive Jimmy Heidel in October of 1986.
right, everybody. Here we are on Flatbush Avenue on the property of the abandoned Toys R Us. Right by the water here, you can see these boats. That is the, it's kind of a back entrance to the marina here. I guess this is Marine Park, kind of smack dab in the middle. We got Mill Basin to, the, to our right. So Marine Park, Mill Basin area. Okay. So after Casso was shot and we went through quickly some of the events that happened, how he had found out about that, who done, who did that. You know, Heidel, Bob Baring, Nicky Guido, and apparently a driver by the name of Tom Latore. He finds out through Kaplan, through his connects that he made, and he was already doing work for the Mafia cops before that. History would, would show us that. And he ends up getting the names. And when they finally get Heidel, they bring him to a warehouse where Apolito is said to take him out of the car and hogtie him and throw him in the trunk. The mafia cops, and I believe Frank Santora Jr., would make their way here in October of 86. and meet Vic Amuso in Anthony Gaspipe Castle, right here. Now, I had drove by this a bunch of times and I kind of pondered like, oh, you know, parking lot, it's kind of ballsy, you know? And I've drove past this time numerous, this place numerous times throughout my life, just cruising by, even though I've never really been here, I'm a Queens guy, but I always like drove by like, you know, it's kind of weird kind of in the parking lot but then I was listening to uh Tommy Dades on Jimmy Calandra's and he talks about kind of this little alleyway that's back here and so we're gonna walk around to the front and we're gonna see now you can see back there this alleyway behind this Toys R Us and we're gonna go make our way to the front now this is kind of an elevated uh extra parking area here Now we're on Flatbush Avenue, as I said again, and then right over there, actually, that's like uh, Highway Patrol Unit 2. Uh, I did that DeMeo video, and I spoke about, I was a, a couple of blocks to the left on the side of the road there. And I talked about them towing uh, his caddy to the Highway Patrol Unit. That's where that photo was taken of him in the trunk. Yeah, that's it. Right across the street there, that's actually uh, the spot. It should be about three years before this event. A little over three years. So that's the Highway Patrol Union on Flatbush. And once again, we are at the Toys R Us, which is said to be the location of the first and only time that Casa would be on the presence in the street of these guys, which is kind of funny because, you know, little by little, like he kind of found out these guys' names, but it really wasn't like, he didn't really like, wasn't really told to him. And Kaplan, I believe, was trying to keep it under wraps and not really have Casa know their names or whatever, but kind of interesting that you would have him for the first, so this is said to be the first job that he would have done for Casa, these two guys, the Mafia cops, but it's kind of interesting that it's a secret as Kaplan might have been wanting to keep these guys' identities, he meets them on the first time, you know, in person here, when they drive here to this parking lot and they give the Jimmy Heidel's body to gas pipe and Vic and this Toys R Us parking lot we're gonna get a view this place looks crazy right now let's get a view of what this building looks like look at this dip look at that watch your step all right So abandoned right now. It's been closed for, I don't know, I'm going to say two or three years now, maybe more. 
a lot of these uh, places have been closing. A lot of these Toys R Us, I don't know how many are left throughout the United States. If anybody knows, if anyone has one that's open by them, let me know. But I think they're all pretty much on the way out, these things. You can see how much of a mess it is. You got some... I think they wrote black and blue under there. Um, kind of a slight to the cops. And then if you see that police badge and the names Mora and Rivera, those two guys were officers that were killed a couple months back. Two young guys that were killed in Manhattan in an apartment, they were ambushed. So we got a little uh, cops versus uh, protesters or whatever action going on here. It's kind of interesting. Cool. So they would meet here in October of 86. And they would hand the bodies over, the body of Jimmy Heidel to Gas Pipe and Vic, right? Back here in this parking lot. And after that, they would go to a home. Now, as far as where that home is, I've always wondered. I'm sure some of you have. Um, and in a couple of a uh, minute or two, we'll go uh, back to the tape and we'll discuss that. And then we will uh, come back again to the street. But let's go look at the alleyway and then uh, we'll get to that segment in a minute. So, here's this little alley back here. So this would be a good place for these guys to meet. They would pull up back here or be waiting back here in this alley. Vic and Gas would uh, pull up in their car. And they would hand over Jimmy Heidel, who at that time would have been hogtied by Eppolito. Tied up probably gagged so he wouldn't be able to scream. Let's look up at these boats. So once again, the location here on Flatbush Avenue, the only, the location, the only known time where gas and Vic are in the presence of the mafia cops, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracappa. So after Heidel, they receive him, they go to a house. Now I'm gonna go out of the streets for a minute and let's go to the tail of the tape. Let's talk about that and I'll be back. In this book here, Friends of the Family, the inside story of the Mafia Cops case, it talks about how law enforcement was able to narrow down exactly the house where Anthony Gaspipe Casso shot and tortured Jimmy Heidel. The story that he talks about on 60 Minutes with Ed Bradley. Now Casso himself didn't really remember where the house was. He knew it was close by to the Toys R Us parking lot, but he just couldn't remember exactly where it was. So in the book, they talk about a few locations they start narrowing down as to where this house was. And they get a hit on one which is on East 73rd Street. And the home was owned by a James Gallo, who was said to be a DeCavalcanti crime family member and an associate of Anthony Gaspipe Casso. Now, there's a couple of more details about this particular property on East 73rd Street. For one, as you could see here, it's very close to the Toys R Us parking lot. There's also some other details that they speak of in the book in regard to the property on East 73rd Street. They mention that the property was sold two years after the Heidel incident 
which would have been 1988. And this property here on East 73rd Street, owned by a James Gallo, we can see that it was sold in 1988, just two years after the Heidel incident. It's also said that when they were going to check the house to see if they could find any DNA in the basement, the property owners at that time were in the midst of selling the house, which they thought would cause a big problem. Now, as you can see here in 2004, this house was sold, which also fits the timeline. So, I ask you, this property on East 73rd Street that was once owned by a James Gallo, sold in 1988, two years after the Heidel incident, right in the proximity of the Toys R Us parking lot, and lastly, sold again in 2004. Is this the house? I think it is. I hope that wasn't too confusing. Now let's go check it out. Okay, everybody. So, if you agree with my assessment that I made just now before returning to the street footage, if you agree with that assessment, then this is the house that you're looking at right here. So we know that this house on East 73rd at that time was owned by a James Gallo. We know that two years later, uh, like it says in the book, according to Dades and the Detectives, that this house was sold in 1988, two years later, which I have shown. And then we know, once again, that around the time of the investigation, we see that this house is sold again, which is mentioned in the book that it was going to be sold when they kind of were fingering the house, when they kind of had it and they wanted to get the search warrants and all that other stuff. And they were worried about the owners. The property was in the midst of being sold. This would have been around 2004, and I have showed that also. So with all those facts and everything that I laid out, I'm going to leave this up to you guys. Do you believe this is the location? Well, actually, I'll just give my opinion. Yes, I do believe this is the location. That in 86, in October, this is where Heidel was brought into this house here. And this house does have a finished basement. That they were brought here to this house, Jimmy Heidel by Casso Vic, and apparently uh, Lastorino and Testa might have been here as well. And this would have been the basement of this house here where that event takes place, where Casso tortures and shoots Heidel, and then he recounts it on the Ed Bradley interview on 60 Minutes. So once again, if you guys are agreeing with my assessment, with the facts that I laid out, then you're looking at that house right here, the basement of this property. here on East 73rd Street. 